from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Time Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. The markets send mixed signals as weather forecasts and recession fears both battle in the markets. The forecast really couldn't look any worse for anyone west of the Mississippi River. Livestock producers aren't just paying more for feed. In some cases, they're on the verge of running out. It seems to be uh, most severe uh, right now in the west. Why rail issues could grow even more severe during harvest. Divine intervention as a stranger saved one teen's life. He was there to save me when I needed it. And a blanket that brought comfort and even more meaning to the rescue. And in John's world, things are looking up for space travel. Now for the news, the commodity markets had a lot to digest this week between weather and a new supply and demand report from USDA. That report stirring up some debate with what some view as an aggressive cut to soybean demand. USDA worked in the 2.63 million acre drop in soybeans from that June acreage report in this latest one. They left yield unchanged, but production was decreased by 135 million bushels to 4.51 billion bushels. They did reduce old crop soybean crush demand by 10 million bushels, reduced new crop soybean crush demand by 10 million bushels, and they reduced the new crop export outlook by 65 million bushels, uh, which you know is questionable while we're in the midst of a uh, you know a very aggressive front end loaded bean program right now. Now, corn production in this WASDE report was up 45 million bushels to 14.51 billion with yield unchanged and higher acres. New crop ending stocks were raised 70 million bushels from last month to 1.47 billion bushels. And all wheat production was 44 million bushels higher at 1.78 billion, with winter wheat raised 1.2 billion and other spring wheat to 503 million bushels. But what seemed to be the bigger news item out of this latest report is USDA showing just how devastating the drought is for cotton production this year. The report showing an increase in planted acres, but it also comes with higher abandonment due to deepening drought in Texas. Harvested area is nearly 600,000 acres less this month, or 32 percent, which is the third highest abandonment on record. The current record was set during the 2011 drought when abandonment hit 36 percent. As bad of a start as the crop had and as bad as the weather rain forecast looks going forward, it wouldn't surprise me at all for for them to bump it up for the actual abandonment rate to climb to climb from here. And you know whether it'll exceed 36% is, is anybody's guess, but uh, it's it, this is one of those historically very bad years. Now, Robinson says fundamentals still don't explain why the December cotton contract has dropped a whopping 31% since its high of $1.32 set on May 17th. So just how bad is the drought in some places? Well, it's so bad that it's forcing some ranchers in Texas to cull their cattle. Just look at this long line outside of the Emory, Texas livestock auction. Texas Farm Bureau says the ranchers are selling cattle because of a shortage of hay and water. So ranchers are also left with few choices except to bring them to market now. They say more than four times the normal number of cattle are arriving at some auctions as part of weekly sales. The latest drought monitor shows that 86 percent of the state is in some kind of drought. Well, new numbers show inflation didn't just continue last month. It actually accelerated with the consumer price index rising 1.3 percent over May. The push coming from record gas prices, soaring rents and higher grocery bills. I think the key there is uh, energy prices. Energy prices uh, by themselves uh, made up uh, half of the monthly increase. Uh, and uh, the uh, report doesn't factor in uh, the uh, decline in energy prices that had occurred in July. The CPI for June was above expectations at 9.1 percent, a new peak with inflation the highest since November 1981. The bond and currency markets are now indicating high odds of a 75-point rate increase. Canada also raised its rate recently by more than the expected 1%. 
Well, as the ongoing crisis continues in Ukraine, talks among Ukraine, Russia, Turkey and the UN about getting grain out of Ukraine appear to be progressing. Officials are working to resume Ukrainian grain exports via the Black Sea port of Odessa, with Turkish officials now saying a framework deal has been reached. A UN official says more technical work needs to take place before the deal is actually done. The Turkish defense minister said the deal would be signed when the parties meet again. That's coming up next week. That's it for the news. Well, there's a lot of eyes on the heat that is building next week. We'll have a check of your forecast next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Enzone from Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13 percent. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your Enzone fan by July 31st and get $200 off. Now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Urasavik. Matt, this dome of heat, dome of doom, whatever you want to call it, it seems to be bringing some intense heat next week, even for July. Yeah, time. that's right. We're dealing with that heat and the humidity right through the middle part of the country, and that's really starting to dry things out, even towards the east as we've been, we looked at a very damp spring across most of the east, most of the Mississippi River Valley, parts of the Mid-South as well, but now things are really starting to dry out, and that's why those drought conditions have really grown over the past month. Still looking at uh, not a whole lot of moisture there in the east this coming week, more chances, but not a whole lot is going to add up and still very dry through Texas up into parts of Nebraska and Kansas and then all the way back to the southwest where those drought conditions will persist as we head through at least the next month. There's a look at the newest drought monitor released on the 14th of July and you can see those drought conditions continue to grow in parts of the east, even along the southeast coast here with extreme with uh, some moderate drought conditions there. Extreme to exceptional drought though back into parts of Texas and back into uh, the San Joaquin Valley, parts of California and Nevada, still extremely dry and not too many chances of rain back there because that dome of heat uh, that time mentioned really back out in the southwest, that big ridge drawing all the way up into uh, parts of the Dakotas. A little bit of a break from the heat there across uh, northern Great Lakes and parts of the northeast, but the heat is going to dig farther to the north, back in the northwest, and still allow for some shower and thunderstorm activity in the east, which could cool things off briefly before that heat really returns. And as we head into next Saturday. Take a look at that. Still very hot and humid across the lower 48. And here's a look at Monday's forecast. We've got uh, a front moving eastward, some showers and thunderstorms out ahead of that. Very hot and humid though across the south and even back into the west where we've got some of those afternoon showers and thunderstorms going to be possible. That continues to be the case on Wednesday back in the Four Corners region. High pressure though for the center of the country and in the northwest staying hot and very uh, dry in the west but hot and humid in the south and east with showers and storms still looking possible and then still looking at some showers back in the four corners. Another storm system coming into the upper Midwest and then that shower and thunderstorm activity not going anywhere for parts of the south and east and Florida as we head through Friday. So temperatures this week much above normal right through the middle part of the country. The only area we're looking at a below normal temperatures is right there for parts of the southwest. And then here's a look at the precipitation above normal right where that front is kind of sticking around below normal right through the middle part of the country. Most of the Corn Belt and the Northern Plains and then above normal there where we got those showers and thunderstorms persisting and next week looks much of the same well above normal through the middle of the country spreading eastward with that heat a little bit more and the same type of setup with our precipitation as we head into next week time back to you well could that heat and that weather forecast impact crop production and does the market even focus on weather right now with talks of a recession Darren Newsom and Trey Cronin join me next Welcome back. Well, as promised, Treg Cronin, as well as Darren Newsom, joining us for the roundtables this week. Well, looking back at this past week, another wild week in the markets. You have the battle between outside money and those recession fears against weather forecasts. But Darren, as you look at it right now, what has been winning out in these markets? 
so far, uh, so far, the you know the move out of the commodity complex as a whole by investment money has been winning out. I mean, we've seen a lot of pressure. We've seen a lot of liquidation. It doesn't matter uh, what market we look at. Hasn't changed the fundamentals. Fundamentals are still bullish pretty much across the board. Just can't get anybody to buy. Uh, and that's even with the type of weather forecast we've seen, particularly for corn and soybeans. Uh, and that, you know, that long term inverted uh, forward curve that we see in crude oil. Investment money is just not interested in any of it at this point. Yeah, Trey, I mean, where you are in South Dakota, you know, you look at the forecast next week and there is a wide just bubble of heat that is setting right over that western corn belt. It doesn't seem like it's coming at a good time for, for corn production and heading into soybean production, but have the markets even responded to those forecasts? Uh, it, it certainly doesn't feel like it, uh, both as, you know, kind of having my analyst hat and farmer hat on. It, it's uh, it's definitely a bit perplexing because, yeah, the forecast really couldn't look any worse for anyone west of the Mississippi River. But uh, I think that the price action the last 10 days, two weeks is a pretty clear sign that, um we just cannot get any momentum to the upside because of the macro influence right now. And as Darren kind of alluded, got crude oil dropping $8 a barrel. Uh, the GFS or the European model or whatever, that, that, that's not going to change that kind of outsized uh, uh, money flow. And, and as I, I guess I find myself reminding guys a lot of times, uh, you know, when we look at our markets, the corn, soybean, wheat market, we're talking about markets of billions. And when you're looking at you know, fixed income, equities, energies, you're talking about markets of trillions. And so the whiplash effect is is just stronger right now than the, the fundamental um, drivers behind the yield. Eventually, that's going to matter. Uh, right now, it's it's just tough to stand in front of this with uh, with the outside influence that we're seeing. Yeah, Darren. So when you look at some of that outside money now setting on the sidelines, when or what would incentivize them to come back in? to commodity markets? How long are we looking at? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question, Todd. I mean, in, to me, what, you know, what, what some of this money could be waiting on, particularly if we're looking at the ag markets, is early, early August, because, you know, if they are long only, if they're long only futures funds, and if they have to be in the nearby futures contract, they don't want to deal with the ridiculous August and September soybean contracts. They don't want to deal with the hybrid September corn contracts. So they're going to wait you know, until we get into early August and we start to see the fund rolling, uh, those that are still in the markets from, you know, from those contracts out to the November soybeans and December corn, they're going to jump back in, particularly if fundamentals are still bullish. Uh, and at that point, they'll also have ridden through what is expected to be a 100 basis point move by, or hike by the, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve this month. So we'll get the, all of that out of the way. We could also start seeing, you know, the possibility of some of some short term bottoms being formed. Uh, in the three key uh, U.S. stock indexes. So there could be a lot of things coming together at the end of this month, possibly bringing the money back in in August. Okay, so Treg, if you are a producer that's still setting on old crop, and according to USDA's latest grain stocks report, it looks like there are more farmers setting on old crop. So if you are, and you're hearing that no matter what the weather forecasts look like, this outside money really doesn't have incentive right now to get back in, what should your game plan be? Uh, we can't change the fact that we've, you know, in 30 to 40 days, depending on where at in the corn belt you are, um, you know, we're going to roll the new crop. So regardless of what the size of this crop is, there's still going to be more than we can use, you know, September, uh, September 15th, October 15th. And so those bids are going to roll and you're going to lose another 60 to 70 cents. So if you're waiting for some kind of a, a, a bottom, a short term bottom, even a weather rally, uh, I think you've got about 20 to 25 days to, to find that out because at some point we are going to shift our, our mindset to new crop um, and, and those bids are going to fall, those cash prices are going to fall. So uh, I think there's, there's a window here of, of about 20 to 25 days for things to kind of um, do what they're going to do if these forecasts don't change. But that's kind of what we're waiting on is, is does this forecast change? Uh, do we start to see some better weather as the calendar flips to August? Or, you know, are, are we really putting the hurt on this thing? And if we are, I think we're going to know pretty quickly. Yeah, definitely. Good reminder. All right. Well, this week, USDA had another report. It didn't touch yield when it came to corn or soybeans. But were there any surprises? We'll ask Darren and Craig coming up later on U.S. Farm Report. Registration is open for the 2022 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Join our team as we gain insight on the 2022 growing season in person or online. 
visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. It's been more than 50 years since Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon, famously declaring one giant leap for mankind. And what's changed since that initial venture into space is vast. Here's John Phipps. I'm getting really tired of Elon Musk. He seems to be trying to become the Kardashian of capitalism. It's a rare day when he doesn't somehow manufacture a headline about himself. And that business model got old for me anyway years ago. That said, and while still staring down the road waiting for my Starlink receiver to come, he has revived public interest in space like a new version of Star Trek. The accomplishments of his company, SpaceX, have been relentlessly astounding to the point that the mind-boggling technology of spaceflight has become routine. In between selling expensive rides to celebrities and billionaires, SpaceX has been steadily launching huge numbers of satellites for any number of purposes. One result of the intrusion of profit-seeking into space programs is shown here. The cost of heaving a kilogram of whatever in orbit has plummeted. This amazing infographic from Visual Capitalist primarily shows a price drop for launches, but if you look down at the bottom, it also shows how huge the vehicles are. The biggest one on the right, the Starship, has revived our moribund science fiction dreams such as permanent habitation on the moon or even Mars. These adventures have gone from laughable to, well, this isn't going to be easy. That one person could ignite this renewed interest in space is remarkable, regardless of the personality involved. It is a comment on our times, however, that such a scientific and technological leap would be accomplished by private entities rather than governments and public investment. It could be that as global wealth increases, especially for a small number of individuals like Mr. Musk, the sluggishness of modern governments and their obsession with cultural controversies will immobilize them from creating our future. I find it ironic that as we gain more knowledge and know and how to use it, make our lives better, we seem less interested as a species in using that power to advance our civilization. Maybe this has always been the case with a few people of vision pulling us forward while the rest look on. Some research suggests our output of new ideas of all types is slowing down, despite having more researchers. My guess is we have made idle watching so easy and the ur urgency so minimal, the number of pioneers is shrinking in proportion to our population. Thank you, John, and his commentary can be found on our Farm Journal YouTube page by using that QR code right there on your screen. Well, when we come back, Machinery Pete has the scoop on a John Deere BR and Tractor Tales next. Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's July 19th online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Hey, welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. Buckle up, because this week we're headed off to near Lake Michigan to check out a 1946 John Deere BR. It was originally built in September of 1946, shipped out of the factory in October of 1946 to Columbus, Ohio. In 1958, it ended up here in Fenville at a local international dealership. In 1959, my great-grandfather bought this tractor used from their lot for 400 bucks going to be their new primary farm tractor. Disc fields, plowed fields all day long. It's a factory electric start. It was a rarer option for the BR. Most of them were hand start. But this one is a post-war tractor, so it would have features like electric start and headlights. It's proclaimed as retired, so just mainly shows and parades. Although we did want to disc the garden this year with it, but the, with the way the soil was, probably couldn't do it with these big, thick rear tires. Yes, this is my personal favorite tractor. It looks the, the best out of all the tractors we have. It's been in the family the longest. And you gotta love that two-cylinder sound. My grandfather, he struggles to get around a little bit anymore, so 
I help him a lot, all I can, and usually with the tractors, he leaves me to do most of the work, and I step right in and help him. I hope that my grandchildren will get to at least experience this tractor and take a few rides with it. Feed users out west have been faced with feed shortages amid transportation trouble with trains. But could those issues grow even more severe at harvest? That's our Farm Journal report next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. As labor negotiations continue past the deadline at West Coast ports, there's another potential problem popping up. Issues shipping via rail. Feed users out west have been battling the problem for months. And as the White House steps in to keep railroads operating short term, there are concerns of bigger issues this fall. That's this week's Farm Journal report. Rail remains a vital piece of transportation of goods across the U.S. But this year, the 140,000 miles worth of railroad laid out across the country has not been immune to the supply chain chaos plaguing the U.S. What I'm hearing from our members is fewer equipment issues, um, but the train times, the amount of time it's taken to get the trains and the reliability of receiving them. With more than 1,000 members today, National Feed and Grain Association represents everything from grain buyers and users to transportation companies who ship the grain. It seems to be most severe uh, right now in the West or for those who are trying to ship West uh, on those lines that are going to the Western part of the country. So just how bad is it? Well, Seifert says some feed users are even reporting being just days away from running out of feed. We, we have heard from more than one member that has had severe difficulty getting feed, sometimes being within um, several hours of being short. Today's issues center around labor and the amount of time it's taking to receive shipments via rail. And you've got challenges with crews who uh, may have been hit by weather, you may have been hit by diversions you got to take with the rail, uh, crews time out. They don't have enough locomotive engineers in the right position. Eric Wilkie of Arizona Grain has seen the issues firsthand. We've got a whole harvest that's, that's basically been received and we haven't been able to ship anything. Wilkie says rail cars that were supposed to arrive in early May are just now starting to trickle in. We never stopped the, the farmers from harvesting. Um, so we have uh, created some rail or large inventories and that has significant cash flow of, you know, impacts on us. The rail concerns really started to mount in March. The railroads had on a mandated requirement instituted precision railroad systems. And so they thought they didn't need as much crews if they can automate some things or be able to have greater visibility of trains. That move came even after the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Railroads were down about 25 percent overall on their staffing even heading into COVID, and so that has exacerbated it. In April, the Surface Transportation Board stepped in, holding a hearing to get to the root of the rail issues. As grain suppliers continue to face wait times, potential feed shortages out west were made known back in April. Now, they, they signal to us in meetings publicly and otherwise that, you know, they uh, are having some success in, in hiring again and getting crews um, success through training. We're in wheat harvest right now, and uh, I don't have time to wait another three months for crews to be trained. Rail companies and unions are in the middle of labor negotiations right now. There are fresh concerns that those labor disputes could come to a head just as harvest hits in the Midwest this fall. Already for Okno Dees, the car values are, are, are today would be somewhere north of $1,000 per car. And so that's the that's the market send, sending a signal that there's going to be tightness. Typically, those bids would be around $100 per car, a potential sign that railroads are not anticipating a quick resolution to the current labor dispute. They're currently in a 30 day cooling off period um, where they're no longer working on arbitration. There's some actions the president can take in mid July 
uh, in the, to uh, appoint a board, uh, which can then make some recommendations that can be acted on. Now, the president has until Sunday night to appoint a presidential emergency board. If he doesn't, the laborers are authorized to strike. Now, if the White House does appoint the emergency board that outlines a recommendation, it gives railroads and the union 30 days to make a decision. And laborers would also be prohibited from going on strike during that time. Once we get into mid-September, there, there's also a risk of some labor issues, even lab, labor stoppage on some of the rail lines. But the hearing in April gave a hint to just how intense those labor negotiations could be. Since 1980, four rail, 40 railroads have been reduced to seven class one carriers, now largely controlled by speculators and hedge fund investors. This culture of profits over safety, customer service, and the lives of railroad workers is now exposed as this industry's network fails on a daily basis. As the labor battle plays out, the short-term issues are causing grain handlers economic pain. I would estimate since the first of the year to date, there's been an order in the order of $100 million paid out by the industry um, to solve this logistic problem that's developed. A battle over labor that seems to have a long tail as those in the grain industry try to work together to make sure this labor shipping vein doesn't buckle. Now, the National Feed and Grain Association told me there have been recommendations made to the Surface Transportation Board regarding more transparent reporting by the railroad, as well as a request for railroads to submit service plans. There are also additional steps that Congress could take to help resolve a portion of the rail bottlenecks and keep rail workers working. All right, when we come back, another look at our marketing roundtables and talk about this weather that's shaping up for next week. That's next. Rejoining us, Darren Newsom, as well as Treg Cronin. Okay, Darren, earlier this week, we got the latest WASDE report from USDA. I know it's typically not a market mover, but were there any things in, in, in those reports that, that were shocking to you? Oh, I have no idea. I didn't even look at them. I don't even pay attention to them. Uh, but from what I can tell in the markets themselves, no, there wasn't any huge surprises. Uh, you know, to me, you know, as Treg touched on in the last segment, you know, the market's going to show his hand, particularly for the old crop, you know, here over the next 20, 25 days. But in the new crop, it just simply hasn't changed. We still have an inverted forward curve or future spreads in the in soybeans, which is telling us, you know, the market believes we're going to stay tight supply and demand throughout the 2022-23 marketing year. And in corn, there's only a slight carry. It's pretty weak carry right now, also indicating uh, there's a great deal of concern for the new crop market. Yeah, and speaking of the cash market, I mean, when you look at basis, that's really been a story that a lot of farmers have been talking about, Treg. Have we seen that story change any as we've been in July? Yeah, I mean, uh, cash markets remain remain strong. And, uh, you know, as one would expect, when you see the type of, of uh, futures capitulation that we've seen over the month of June, and uh, first half of July, Bendor's whatever is out there, whether you believe the USDA or not, that that's beside the point. But Bendor's have been locked. Farmer selling has has really slowed down, especially as you see December corn coming down to those uh, February crop insurance prices. That's a big psychological level to a lot of farmers. So the 590, um, you know, December corn level that we averaged during February. Uh, even though actual coverage levels uh, don't really offer much protection until lower than that, it's still a psychological barrier. And so until we have a lot of confidence about this crop and farmers can look out in their fields and go, yeah, I've got confidence in a 150 bushel, 200 bushel yield, whatever that case might be, I think the selling is going to remain limited uh, until we either see a rally or that confidence comes around. Darren, in the case of, of corn, we know that 50% of the, the crop got planted in two weeks, according to the crop progress report. When you look at, at, at soybeans, you know, we've seen that that weather market be pushed back a little bit with corn. With soybeans, do you think it will be a typical weather market or because of this outside money? Could that timeline also be altered? Yeah, I think it. I think it could be altered a little bit, but I think soybeans are more on their normal timeline. Uh, you know, so here again, in another week or two, I think I think traders are going to be paying a lot more attention. You know, when it comes to soybeans, to the weather forecast, uh, I think they're. You know, I think soybeans are going to take front. You know, center stage instead of corn. We're going to have a better idea of what's out there for the corn market. But again, I, I think the money is just going to stay on the sideline at least for a while. And if the weather is still, you know, seen as adverse by the time we get into early August, again, you know, August is traditionally the key month, or at least thought to be the key month for uh, for soybeans. And then that really could light a fire under this thing. But again, it, it, it's going to be short lived. 
Treg, I know you farm and you talked about kind of conditions in your backyard, but you also talk to a lot of farmers. So when it comes to corn and soybean conditions, where are you hearing that conditions are, are, are really good? And where are you hearing that conditions are, are starting to show those, those signs of struggle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, to the good, um, I think Illinois is in, is in really good shape. Iowa is in, is in good shape for the most part uh, after some rains that came, you know, kind of around the 4th of July holiday. And uh, a lot of South Dakota is in good shape. Um, we received a, a fair amount of rain. Indiana is a, a, is a tough spot. They've been running moisture deficits. They've picked up some rain. But all in all, I think that the, the bulk of the Corn Belt is in decent shape right now. I think it's the next 10 days, two weeks that a lot of people are worried about as these key developmental uh, stages come and go. But um, Kansas is in very tough shape, uh, has been for a long time. Nebraska is the other one that, that I think there's a lot of concern around. Um, you know, when you've got 100 degree temps and, and especially those nights where you don't cool off below 70 to give that crop a break, those are the ones that I think that uh, that are really a concern right now. But um, for all the late planting and, and issues that we saw in Northeast uh, South Dakota, a lot of North Dakota, um, the Northern Plains, they, they've been uh, adequately watered, uh, look good for the most part. And again, I think a lot of the I states are in decent shape, but it's, it's what are we going to look like as of August 1st, I think is going to tell the tale more so than, than what we look like today. Well, Treg, Darren, thank you so much for joining us this weekend and all of that insight. We greatly appreciate it. All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. Well, sometimes we're just in the right place at the right time. Some say that's a coincidence, but Dewey Johnson says it's more like divine intervention. When Bismarck Tini Durr and her mom say whichever it is, Dewey's presence is nothing short of good news. And they hope after hearing what he did, more people might be a little bit more like Dewey. Jody Kurzman from affiliate KFYR has the story. Talk about the road less traveled. Not many cars travel this stretch of gravel. Those that do have a good reason to be here. Dewey Johnson's home for the past 37 years is just over the hill. I travel it every day. It's usually a quiet, uneventful drive. But last week, something unusual caught his eye. There was just something there that was just absolutely just out of the ordinary. Dewey pulled over for a closer look. That was as I was coming down here. That's when he I mean, realized what had caught his eye was a body lying in the ditch. First thing that came to my mind that she was dead. She was Rain Jensen. Rain wasn't dead, but she was badly injured after she fell off the horse she was riding. When I seen Rain laying in the ditch, I knew immediately that her leg was broken. I fell on my knee and then it broke my femur. Dewey sat with Rain while they waited for the ambulance. He was there to save me when I needed it. Rain says Dewey is her guardian angel. He gave me a blanket. Um, while I was laying there because I got really cold. That blanket holds a lot of meaning for Dewey. This is the blanket. It's the blanket his late wife Donna used after every chemo treatment. Donna's been gone for 13 years. Dewey never took the blanket out of his truck. Dewey says that was his guardian angel, his late wife, Stepping in. Thank you. Mm, thank you. This is the first time Dewey and Rain have seen each other since the accident. It's the first time Dewey and Rain's mom, Nicole, have ever met. Rain is inspired to be more like Dewey. You don't hear about the kindness that happens. You hear more about the bad. But I think that the kindness is really important. But Dewey insists he didn't do anything remarkable. He did what's right. I would crawl on broken glass and burning coals and barbed wire to go help somebody. I have pretty strong faith. I know that God puts us on this world for a purpose. On this day, on this dusty country road, Dewey's purpose was to help a young girl, a stranger who now 
is more like family. North of Bismarck, I'm Jody Kurzman reporting for your news leader. Thank you, Jody. Well, Rain says this is the beginning of a special friendship that three hope to go out to lunch soon. Rain actually started physical therapy a few weeks ago and hopes to be healed in time for a cross country season in the fall. All right, when we come back, questions about health when it comes to drought. Hands off the Great Lakes. Your next piece of equipment is on machinerypeat.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for only on MachineRepeat.com. Well, as we talked about earlier in the show, drought is deepening in some of the hardest hit areas of the country right now, and half of the U.S. is now in at least moderate drought. But why can't the U.S. figure out a way to move water to areas that need it most? That's customer support this week. Regular viewer Eric Smasino asks a question that uh, pops up from time to time during droughts. Why has the government never taken action besides Lake Mead to move water around the country like we do energy? Seems like there are many times pumping water west from the east would help both regions. Well, I'm not, I can't see how it would help the east, but let's go on. As the western U.S. continues to suffer from a 22-year mega drought, it's hard not to look at a map and zero in on the Great Lakes as the obvious solution. All we need to do is pump some of that supposedly excess fresh water west, like this idea from William Shatner to pump Lake Superior water to the Green River and then on down to Lake Mead. After all, the Great Lakes are one of the largest sources of fresh water in the world. This idea faces some huge hurdles. California alone uses the same amount of water as the entire Red River flow. Even supplying a fraction of that would take pipes of unimaginable size. Canals would suffer enormous evaporative loss. The water would have to be pumped over the Rocky Mountains, a roughly 6,000 foot lift. Power costs alone to move that much water would make it extremely expensive. But the biggest problem would be political. Every governor adjacent to the Great Lakes, the Canadian and U.S. government, not to mention all the states all along the way on the pipeline, would have to agree. Color me doubtful that would ever happen. The economic and environmental impacts are almost incalculable. Besides, we can watch China as its love of monumental projects has it building something on this scale, a water diversion network that together would stretch from Boston to Caracas, Venezuela. This mammoth undertaking already looks undersupplied and certainly overpriced. There is a more obvious answer staring water short states in the face. Agriculture uses 50 to 80 percent of western water supplies. My guess is our outdated water laws will soon be under intense attack to free ag water for residents. For example, as the Great Salt Lake disappears, Salt Lake City is one of the fastest growing urban areas in the U.S. Using 80 percent of Utah's water supply, and that's what it is, for ag when domestic demand there will exceed supply around 2040 looks unworkable to me. While I am confident water shortages will be managed by states and municipalities, moving water from the Great Lakes to the West is a pipe dream. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Thank you, John. Well, up next, a couple who's about to embark on a 3,000 mile trip across the U.S. and Canada on a tractor. We'll talk about the tractor trip for kids next. Well, driving 3,000 miles in 60 days is not a quick trip, but when you're doing so in a tractor as a way to raise money for kids, it's much more than just a trip. And for one couple, the tractor trip is driven by purpose and passion as they travel from Nebraska to Alaska starting this week. Total 3,910. That's how many miles they plan to travel in this. The tractor itself was about $3,500. Over five months, Dick and others have fixed up this tractor that they named Aggie. We adapted a cab from a, an Alice Chalmers XT170. Tractors are hard to find and expensive, so they bought one here and are driving it to Alaska with no AC and a max speed of 20 miles per hour. They'll stop at Case IH dealerships along the way, all in an effort to raise money. 
Carol said, uh, said, what would we do with the money? And I said, well, this might be a good place to put it. The Oranas are raising money for the Colorado Children's Hospital Foundation, a hospital that saved Dick's daughter's life 58 years ago this week. But she just refused to eat. They told her, told us, put her in the car and go to Denver, don't stop. And so Dick and his late wife did just that. We dropped her off, uh, dying. But the Denver Children's Hospital did something Dick will never forget. We don't hospital a lot. And uh, this is kind of a way to help pay that back. <laughs> With a goal of raising $100,000, passion and purpose is what's driving this tractor trip for kids. There's so many kids out there that that um, that need the resources and the research that Children's Hospital um, does. And if you'd like to follow along as they make their journey from Nebraska to Alaska or to donate to the cause, go to tractortrip.com or visit the Tractor Trip for Kids Facebook page. We'll also include links on U.S. Farm Report Facebook and Twitter pages as well. All right, that does it for the show this weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to join us next weekend as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.